That's a level. Does this work? Cool. So I focus on things that fo that fit into one person life. Um, if I choose to maintain a service that needs um, watering for an hour a day, and I just choose to maintain 24 of those, um, well, that's my one person life. Um, that's not going to do do me any harm. Any 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 uh, any uh, long term benefit. So I choose software that um, has a better chance of maximizing my time to choose other software to do other things. Um, I find myself going up and down the stack um, a bunch, and uh, I focus sometimes on administering servers for, for a reason that's relevant to my development um, and without being, without, without being woken up at 2 a.m. because there's nothing like debugging at 2 a.m. Um, to make you rethink your choices to not be a goat herder. Um, I also like not paying money. So paying cloud providers to do these things for me um, doesn't appeal to me because if my develop development projects don't make me any money and I'm spending money on that, well, I've just traded um, this part, some, of that, uh, some of that human life um, to pay for things that I'm then maintaining and spending more on. It's, it's, a, it's a vicious circle, and I um, try to avoid it. So I end up with stuff on my own gear, um, services running. Um, I learned a couple facts that are um, ever so annoying. One of them is that hardware will die. I had a computer named, whatever, insert name here. It died. It died. Um, can you, by a quick show of hands, has anybody depended on a server and never had it die? Never had the hardware fail on you? Two. Cool. Oh, yeah. Um, enterprise, enterprise grade hardware? Enterprise grade hardware. And uh, life cycles to get rid of it sooner? Okay. Well, eight years. Eight year, eight year life cycle. Well. That's pretty good. Yeah. Pretty good. Um, I was. I've not been quite so fortunate. I um, have a dust-filled um, place, and okay. So, not, but on ones you were depend, you, so you didn't have the ones you were depending on die. Just, just ones you weren't depending on. Okay. So you did have computers that died. Okay. Um, the other important fact is that we don't run computers, these hardware machines that die, um, for the purposes of heat. I once tried to defrost a chicken behind an HP DL580. I ran out of time before the chicken um, had even come close. Um, these machines are not particularly good at generating heat, except for when you don't want them to. Um, <laughs> you're going to... so. Uh, you mean they're good at generating heat in your nice air-conditioned place where you've got it handled? Your HPC. Your HPC, okay. Yeah. Um, you probably, you've got good air conditioning too, I assume. We do. Uh, can you defrost a chicken in your hot aisle? Cool. Yeah, well, I'm, I've, I've not been quite so fortunate. But you, you don't, run, don't run those machines for, uh, um, f for, for the jokes. Uh, you run them because you have people who need... Um, services. Um, there are things that people need to get done and they want to do that. So I'm going to skip ahead two sides and get come back to them in just a moment. Um, at one point I was asked to run some services. Now given, given the fact that machines die and you need to run services on machines, I made a couple technolo technological choices. Um, one is that I decided that the underlying hardware had better not matter if I can at all avoid it. So I needed a container format. So I chose virtual machines as my container format. Um, that's, that, that's a container format, right? right? It's not OCI compatible, but you know. <laughs> Partly because I've got Windows services because not everything runs on Linux or not everything runs best on Linux. And remember that part about person life. I don't want to spend my time chasing an app that is running under, under Wine on Linux because I didn't want to run Windows. Um, 
that takes too much time and effort and I don't want to do that. I want to get to the point of, of uh, I, I run a job wherever it makes sense to run a job. Um, so in Windows, I've got that. Um, I considered a bunch of things. Um, I looked briefly at Kubernetes. I built open SUSE um, Rancher, not, uh, not Rancher, um, uh, Harvester didn't exist, so you can't, uh, so, so you couldn't really run VMs on Kubernetes. It didn't want you to do that. You, you, but you can, you, you mean you can run v Kubernetes in VMs? Well, there, 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 are some, there are some options to run VMs on Kubernetes, but I ended up going with HashiCorp Nomad. Hey, a quick show of hands. Anybody familiar with HashiCorp Nomad? Um, for those who are, this, uh, for the remote, remote attendees, that was about four people. Um, for the, um, the central concept of HashiCorp Nomad is you end up with a job that downloads an artifact and runs it. Um, and it will, when your job fails because the underlying hardware died, fact one, machines die, um, will go ahead and reschedule that job somewhere else um, on something else you've got. Um, and hopefully you, run, you um, keep up your replacement rate of machines before uh, you no longer have room. Um, so, so, long, so long as that maintains, you're, you're in a good place. Around this time, I was also switching my favorite language. I used to, my favorite language used to be C. Um, that's no, I, I now will reach for closure instead. And one of the things from going from a procedural language to a functional language is you realize how much state um, everything actually has. Uh, you need your database, which has stuff you've got. People love to reach for files. Um, and uh, people, have, people when, they, when people send a chat message, that chat message is state. Uh, you congratulations! You've got yourself um, something that needs to mutate, something that needs to adjust. Um, and uh, well, I, I don't say all jobs have state. Most jobs have state. Uh, you can't have a job that's entirely stateless. Um, I would consider configuration to if it can if it can be changed to be state um, as well. And. Things that change have a have a habit of changing the wrong way at 1.30 a.m. Um, in time for you to be woken at 2. Um, if you have something that can, that can change, it will. Um, uh, what's his name? Um, Murphy's Law. It will change. It will change at the wrong time. It will change when you're not ready to deal with it. So the goal is for my little cluster, which runs Nomad and, um, uh, and, and uh, runs jobs straight up, to minimize state. Now remember, I've got, the, I've got those Windows machines. The easiest way to run Windows machines as a VM, and if you can't mutate stuff, is to go ahead and mount C over a network share of some sort. Mount your C drive over a network share and put everything in that one place. Well, there's a problem. Um, you're going to have a fun time with patches that apply when they want to or when you wanted them to and rolling them back and, uh, and or trying to coordinate with other people and you're going to end up with um, a lot of back and forth you didn't need um, just because uh, you, you mounted stuff changeable. So I decided on a particular approach um, which um, has served me well in the intervening several years. Um, and um, is beginning to show dividends at, um, in, in, in new environments as well. First off, keep everything off the metal. If you've got a Windows machine, don't install it to the bare metal. Give it, uh, install the virtualization plugins and drivers that you need so you can just give it a virtualized disk. Uh, give it a virtualized network card because you don't want to care about that. And um, that leaves you um, a little, little, uh, little, little higher up. Um, don't uh, try as much as possible to have any shared state you've got be in a place where all of your jobs can access them. 
Docker volumes are a great example of this because Docker likes giving, give, giving you the option of volumes. Uh, you pass something to your container and you say, here, here's a mount point on my current file system. Here's somewhere, somewhere on my hard drive you can go and grab, or I'll say drive, or you can go grab the files you need and mount them read only or read write or whatever you want. Well, that volume lives on your machine. That doesn't satisfy um, not caring about which machine it's on. Machines die. It's very annoying. But you still need state. So what do you do? You go ahead and you start doing things like mounts to other places. Kick the can down the road. Put your state in a different bucket. Maybe put your state in a same bucket that's backed up. Maybe may have a little bit of hardware redundancy. Maybe have a little bit of, uh, of higher availability than any single piece of hardware you've got. Um, maybe it's an NFS mount, maybe it's iSCSI, maybe it's some other Santec. You go ahead and you um, put all your state in a big bucket. Uh, if you had a bunch of birds, it was, this would be the aviary. You put them all in one place and they go out and come back to, this one, to, the, to, the central, um, to the central thing. And then you try to limit your state. Don't mount C on that iSCSI volume. Um, if you mount C on that iSCSI volume, again, you're going to have problems with, with mutation. Um, and more importantly, if you want to schedule things like patches, it's much better to find out your patch doesn't work um, when you've got your, a VM on your laptop than when you've got a VM in your production environment. Everybody has a testing environment. Some of us are lucky enough to have a separate production environment. Some of us have, the, and have had the engineering put in for us or have done the engineering um, to make separate development environments. It's not the default. <laughs> the developers write code to run, and then you're like, okay, well, it's running now. Maybe you haven't put in the engineering effort to then, uh, I've done this several times, where I did not have a good development mode for software I'd written. And, well, it uh, turns out you, you, you got to put in that engineering work where you're going to have a hard time finding all of your bugs in production where everybody notices, and, again, um, you get woken up at 2 a.m. So minimize what you're mounting. If you've got a database, find a way to just keep the database stuff. If you've got configuration, does that configuration need to change? Maybe, maybe not, probably not. Uh, your configuration can probably be checked into something like Ansible or Salt, and uh, you, can, you, you can apply it every single time. Why? Because you're trying to minimize your state. You're trying to minimize anything that can change underneath you. Um, if you can have it built into your VM, that works too. You've got your configuration built straight in. Um, well, there, there, there's, a, there's a pitfall there, but, um, you, but where, where if you try to spin up a development environment and you've got your configuration set in the VM, well, how do you point? It, it, there, there's, 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 some, uh, uh, there's, there's some toys you can play with, and um, the subject of the talk, HashiCorp Packer, um, is one of those toys that makes this easy. Um, oh, and importantly, keep it easier to rebuild your environment um, than just keep maintaining the old one. Now, it's going to be easy to just keep maintaining an old one. We've all had a machine, my laptop, I run, a, I run packages updates, I package updates on it. Every machine, you can run, a pa you can run an update on it, you can get, a, get from one version to the next, and it's fantastic, it's easy. It's, but you want to, if you can, make it easier to, um, to go, to go, uh, to go, to go, to to go even earlier and not run those package updates and actually rebuild if you can. Now, it's always going to be a little bit easier to run package builds, so it's, this is going to be an uphill battle. Um, but I think it's I think it's worth the benefits. So I had this infrastructure. I started with building VMs manually. Go ahead, you've, we've all done it. You go ahead and you um, pick, pick a VM, you, a VM hypervisor, you stick, stick it on your machine, you attach an installation media, you enter and type your way through the prompts and, oh, what's your host name? Oh, well, that's, that's a fun one. Um, and you, at the end, you've got yourself a VM image, you shut, shut it down and you export it somewhere. This works, um, but then you have to, again, lifecycle your VMs. 
what do you do when you've got your VMs mounted read only everywhere? Um, if you don't have mutable, your mutable C drive or mutable slash, what do you do? Well, you end up shutting it down, you move it to another machine and you bring it up again in mutable mode. You go ahead and you do your changes. Well, because you don't actually have to do the moving during your downtime because you've got your, because you can move the machine in advance. Remember, it's an immutable image. When it starts up again, it's always the same image. Um, so you can move it in advance and you can apply your patches and then you can move it back. But that's a bit of a song and dance. Um, so I moved on to Pixie, Pixie booting. Anybody tried Pixie booting hardware before? A good, good, good portion. It works. It works pretty well. You, you go ahead, you make, make a, you make a machine, you give it a MAC address, you've got your MAC address, you um, bring up your Pixie boot and um, congratulations, it goes ahead and installs. One of the things this forces you to do is it forces you to start using state management. It forces you to start actually being able to run commands and bring up your system. You can no longer sit there at the keyboard pressing enter. You can no longer just go ahead and say, oh, I need this package, go ahead and install it. You're pixie booting. Well, what happens when, what happens when, the, when, the, when the machine dies? Uh, well, you bring it back up. What if happens if the, if the VM gets shut down? Either you save that disk somewhere, which with Nomad you can't. Remember that it's the download-only approach. Um, or, and, and for, for example, I've got OpenBSD um, uh, web relays for on, listening on 443 for me. I, they different on a container, I can use a different kernel, it's great fun. Um, those VMs get built every single time um, they boot, which means that if I need to change a configuration setting, I just go ahead and I cycle all of them, um, not at the same time, and uh, I end up with um, hopefully user, users not noticing um, that the a critical piece, critical connection has just changed. So, but then it becomes brittle because I have OpenBSD VMs. OpenBSD does versioning every six months. They've got, they, cut, they cut a new version. And congratulations, you now need to go up to the new version. What happens when you need to want to test one of those things? Again, everybody's got production. Not everybody has it. Everybody's got tests. Not everybody has, everybody has production. Um, I end up using Thousand Eyes Shoelaces, uh, which is a fun Pixie Boot manager. Um, which allows you to do hostname or IP based or subnet based um, decisions on where you're going to, of, of what, what payload you're going to give your Pixie client. Um, this makes Pixie booting about as nice and painless as it can get. But it's still brittle because you need to have a local cache of, your, of the artifacts you're downloading. You've got, you're running an install every single time. Windows doesn't like this approach. It does not want to be pixie booted and installed every single time. You can, you can get away with it on Linux or, or OpenBSD. Not so much on, uh, on, on, on bigger and heavier guys. So then you move on and you say, well, we're, good. we're not going to worry about having our images built um, uh, at runtime, we're going to build them before. This gives you some abilities. Um, I like HashiCorp as a company. They make Packer. Um, they're they're on a quest to make advanced infrastructure available to everybody as readily as possible. They make Terraform, Nomad, Console, um, also other things. They made Vagrant back when that was um, a big deal. Now they're rewriting Vagrant. Um, Packer makes things straightforward because it fits all of your builds into a bucket you're already familiar with. You've got your builder. This is a list of community-supported builders. You've got, you, found your, you found your cloud hoster on there, I hope, um, because most cloud hosters are on there. If you've got a VM and it's running in a place, you can, you can build it somewhere. Running on, on Quemu, running on VirtualBox, you can go ahead and you just provide this as your builder. Um, it has provisioners, Ansible, Salt, shell scripting. Um, what, what, if you can run a command to make a change on your system, uh, you can do that. It communicates over SSH and WinRM, which is uh, Windows. Um, so you can, in fact, <laughs> so you can, in fact, run your automation on and on anything with an SSH connection or Windows. Um, it takes then a post processor. 
that will allow you to do any special things you need to do with your um, with your built with your uh, with your with, with your machine after you've done it. So let's say you've got a VirtualBox build, but now you need to upload it to vSphere. Congratulations, you can do that. Um, it works pretty well, actually. Um, it's limited by your trunk. How fast can you upload box uh, images to your to your environment? Um, you can just do that in a post processor and get your build time down pretty far. Um, it also has two internal concepts that it's worth knowing about. Um, remember, all these, by the way, are plugins. They are individual processes that Packer runs as RPC binaries, all written in Golang, that allow you, or Go, I'm sorry, people who are mad about that, um, who, uh, you, 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 you all run as RPC binaries and provide things um, to your Packer build. Um, artifacts. Artifacts are essentially this is a thing I have in EC2. That means you've got you've got all the you've got the pointers you need to actually uniquely identify your instance um, in in a local VM build. That means the files that are on disk um, or a pointer to where you can find them. Um, and in all these other sources, they all have their own little artifacts that allow you to um, allow allow you to uniquely identify your thing. Data sources, um, basically stuff you can put in a variable. They're not particularly important. They're very useful when you need them. You won't need them most of the time, but when you do, you will use them, and you'll be very happy. This is a pack this is a Packer file. This is everything except for the actual salt configuration applied there um, and the um, pre that config which is provided to the build there. Packer goes ahead, it boots up your machine, it types in stuff for you because early boot is hard to automate, so how do you do it? Well, you connect over whatever connection mechanism you've got and you type stuff. Or it types it for you, escape to get out of boot, and you type stuff, and then you press enter, and congratulations, you're on your way to boot. Um, it then tries to SSH in. Um, that timeout is more than double the time that I would need to actually build this VM on hardware I build it on. Um, that's, De that's a Debian install with the pre -seed I've chosen. And it goes ahead, and it goes from no image whatsoever all the way up to downloading the, the ISO it needs and caches it um, so that it can ins insert your installation media and then it just runs stuff until it gets to, until it gets to an SSH prompt. Then it hands it off to the build um, where your build um, then runs provisioners on it and if you can get yourself down to a single provisioner you're having a good day. Um, if you have a whole lot of provisioners, you're going to end up duplicating stuff a lot. And, um, it, but you're still going to have a better day because you're going to be able to, in a single command, build your, enti build your entire VM. Um, Packer does have a fun shortcoming, which is that uh, you can't build a base image and then um, build derived images from that. You've got, to, uh, you, you've got to either have one step where you build your base and then derive your images, or go from no magic image whatsoever, you're downloading the install ISO and doing the full install all the way through your final, final approach. Depending on your time constraints, depending on how long your automation takes to run, depending on how long your OS takes to install, this may be acceptable, this may not be. So you've got to, um, you've got to consider you might need to make a magic Binary, but you can magic artifact. But you can make those magic artifacts with Packer, so you can at least go back to um, your 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 first principles and um, build up from source everything you've got. Um, but I was talking about state. If you have VMs that are in fact stateless, where at least it doesn't matter if you've got stuff going on. It doesn't matter if you've got um, <laughs> it doesn't matter if you've got um, things that things 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 can be wiped away. Um, you want mount all your state in places that you know of it. You've got NFS mounts, which you might be able to pass in through a Packer variable, um, which 
um, unlike Ansible, by the way, Packer does let you set variables from the command line and environment variables. Um, so you can just set, export an environment variable, and Packer will grab it as the value. Um, it's, ha it's handy stuff, but it lets you go ahead and you build your VM. OK, well, I want to, instead of pointing at my production backend service, I want to point at my dev backend service for this one, because I don't actually know if my environment's going to be right. So you go ahead and you just rebuild, and there you go. Um, you end up controlling your state, because if you can rebuild all your VMs, then why would you spend time maintaining them if you can rebuild them? Because if you maintain your VMs, then you've got to worry about the overhead of, of well, OK, well, how, how is this going to affect uh, my operations? How is this going to affect my sleep? How is this going to affect um, and, and any of my customers? If you build it, that same VM can go through QA, you can go through, you, you can pop it up in a dev environment and go, well, let's see why it broke. You can pop up the same thing because that is the same image as you're running and as you're actually running. You're running it anywhere you want to because it's a single non-changing image. And if it isn't a non-changing image, and if for some reason you manage to mutate your state, um, go ahead and reboot. Congratulations. New v, new Reboot from known state, no, no good state. You get woken up at 2 a.m., you're rebooting the VM, you move along. Um, you, uh, you, you, you don't have to worry about, um, you, don't have to, you don't have to worry about getting into a bad, known bad state. There's an interesting paper on how, um, inter inter interesting essay on how rebooting, turning it off and on again, is the only, what's the word, um, proper um, principled way to fix most computer problems. Now, sure, an administrator of sufficient skill with sufficient time will be able to go ahead and go in and figure out what broke, what flipped, what changed, why, why, why is my configuration all of a sudden wrong? Again, an administrator of sufficient time. Um, it's much easier to just go ahead and say, you know what? I know it broke, and I'll look out for that later. I'll reboot it. Reboot, move along. And if it breaks again, well, maybe I've got a pattern. Reboot again and spin up that same VM somewhere else, and you've got your and, you can, and look look for the patterns, look for look for look for what's going on. Maybe it's worth your time at that point. If it's if it's happening happened one time, maybe your ECC RAM somehow failed. Um, maybe you've got a bad bit somewhere. Maybe some user tried to execute a malicious payload, and um, you're 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 gonna you're gonna have a really good time. But maybe they won't do that again. Maybe they will, and you'll be able to. Um, to play with that later at your own leisure uh, instead of whenever it decides to happen. Um, somebody who may or may not be watching this later um, uh, calls this old technology, calls virtual machines old technology because after all, we've got containers. Containers allow you to take your machine, you've got a one kernel that's shared among everything, and you run your application in its own namespace. It, it thinks it owns the machine-ish. Um, and it goes ahead and it starts talking on your network. And it has ports and it's got mounts and all the rest of that. And you can make, schedule those con containers among massive fleets of machines. You can have thousands of hardware machines. And your container can live anywhere among them. With uh, something like uh, with, with HashiCorp console, you can go ahead and say, here's a DNS query. Go ahead and ask. And I'll give you where this, where this service actually is right now. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very cool thing. Not all jobs can be containerized. Not all jobs can easily be containerized. And not all jobs can you easily containerize in the time you've got available. Um, so you've got occasionally to run VMs um, instead of things. So, you've, so you add a, some overhead when you run a VM instead of a container. You worry about your disk space. It's an immutable image, which means you reboot to clear your logs. But you might want to shift those logs somewhere else. And you've got to worry about these sorts of things. Um, your kernel is unique in each VM, which means you can't just under upload the, update the underlying kernel on the hardware and get a new kernel in your VMs. You have to rebuild your VM. Maybe not a bad thing. Maybe a good thing that your kernel doesn't change underneath you and you're, um, when, when, without, without you knowing about it, you go ahead and you read any uh, sufficiently large company's tech blog and you're going to see 
how a kernel update hosed our networking. Um, and uh, you're, you'll see, oh, the, the memory allocator in this version of Linux managed to break. And when our containers migrated to the new infrastructure, they were all of a sudden on a new v, on, a, on a new uh, on a, on a new uh, on the new allocator, and we hadn't accounted for that because it wasn't an option when we started writing this service. Um, and now you've got yourself, um, a, if not an outage, at least a whoopsie. Um, maybe a higher bill that month than you expected, and it's it's annoying. But it does have benefits. Does have does have drawbacks. Same as the same as any other tool. Um, both containers and virtual machines allow you to just shut them down and bring them back up and you are in a known good state. There is nothing that has changed. This is exactly what you've shifted. This is exactly what you shipped, sorry. Um, this is exactly what you um, gave everybody. This is exactly what you've tested. This is exactly what's gone through QA. This is exactly what's gone through your security scans. It's the same thing. Um, it's just right there. And I think that the most important modern part the thing that makes a modern infrastructure different from classic infrastructure, and I'm speaking out from some inexperience here, not having spent 20 years doing classical infrastructure, defining your edges, defining where your services talk, and um, knowing from something that you can point to uh, and say, this is exactly what happened to make that image, is what separates classical infrastructure from, um, for, from modern cloud-native approaches, or I use cloud-native to, to, as an all-encompassing term, whatever. Um, if you can, point, you can point to a Docker file and say, my, my builder command ran, to get, ran this Docker file. This is exactly what's there. Um, you will point to your Packer configuration and say, uh, this is a... Uh, the, the, these are these are this is a salt state that was applied. This was this was exactly what went there. You can go ahead and say this is exactly um, how you um, this this is exactly how you ended up building uh, your services, allowing you to do inspection of your production environment without being there, um, and allowing you to define all of your services edges so you can control those edges and make sure you don't end up with nasty surprises when something changes underneath you. Um, that's what I think separates modern from classical infrastructure, and I think that's a way to run virtual machines without hating your life um, at some point at 2 a.m. when you're up there um, trying to figure out why everything is down and all of your users are impacted, and it sucks. Um, so you end up, hopefully, um, hopefully this gives you an, an, an approach you can, you can use that um, let, lets, you, lets you minimize the stuff that can go wrong. Um, any questions? Comments? Heckling? Just been quiet. <laughs> Oh, the, the, that was the, that was the uh, f I was I was asked to run services and was like okay well um, if I've got to run services I uh, might as well do it in such a way that um, that does that isn't painful. Oh yeah, uh, my home my home network's down right now because um, my machines don't wake up um, from magic packets. Um, so none of my infrastructure for any demos of here's here's an actual uh, for example here's an actual instance of a chat app or whatever are running right now. Uh, <laughs> so um, when I get home and press the power buttons, it'll all come right back up. But um, yeah, uh, you can reach me on IRC after I get home because right now my bouncer is down because um, it's on this infrastructure. Um, well. I think each, each, both of both container and VM technologies have their places and their tools to get the job done, and hopefully, tools to get the job done in the least amount of my time possible. It does. One thing I've noticed when I started working with containers is like, okay, we have these standards around like registries and container images and all that stuff. And it's like, wait, why can't we do this with virtual machines? Like, why is it like, oh, you're a virtual machine? Now you gotta go into like using ISO images, which raise your hand if you burned a CD in the last 10 years. Why the hell we still use ISO images? 
Apparently it's on the F twenty uh, on the F thirty five, and F twenty two. So it's 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 at, it's at least flying, um, even if that that might scare scare you. Um, but yeah, go carry on. So, so your point is that you that we got standards around uh, for, for for folks on stream. We got standards around um, uh, mach machines that you can download from a red do from a Docker yeah, registry, right. for example. Um, you 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 download and go. <laughs> yeah. If there was an index of OVAs, but you tend to bake secrets into VMs. VMs don't take environment variables that well, so you've got to have some way of connecting that to your secrets infrastructure in yeah. some way. It's much more fun to pass around Packer files. People do. Um, you, get, you can go on GitHub, there are a bunch of Packer files that you can just find um, that you then build your images from there. The distinction with, 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 with like things like a Docker, with like things like a container registry, you get to download pre-built things, but I think um, the, 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 point, the point's good that there's, that there's so much more going into each VM that maybe you don't want to download someone else's VM. Um, maybe you want to actually. Um, well, I mean, like, it would be like, you know, the Docker file, like, you could double date. Or I, I work for Red Hat, so maybe I should be saying container file. Um, that's a <laughs> odd man joke. We got it, we got it. You, you can get a magic base image if you want to. Um, some builders, for example, will let you, um, I think the VirtualBox builder allows you to specify, um, hey, just go ahead and copy this base image that I'm passing you. Don't use it as installation media. This is now your new hard drive, congratulations. Um, and you will be able to just start from that base. But if you can control your base by default, and unless unless the usability is that much better, I don't I, I don't know. The usability might be better to have to have a downloadable VM that you just run and congratulations, everything's set up for you. Um. The reason I was saying is because like I work in networking, and a lot of times when you want to build like test networking setups, you can't. Containers don't really work for it. You end up having to like run everything in VMs and do bridging and whatnot. So. Yeah, that's the that's the speed. Multiple, uh, does Packer handle multiple network interfaces? 
why would you put multiple network interfaces in your build as opposed to where you run it? If you've got a if you've got a, if you've got a image you're building and you want to go ahead and as you're saying um, get attach multiple network interfaces to it, I do that. I build machines that are then attached to multiple network interfaces because I've got my NFS on a different VLAN, for example, um, and I want to keep it that way. So I attach the I attach the HTTP traffic VLAN and the NFS traffic VLAN and um, you know, some of those can go over different hardware at different times, whatever it is. Um, you, you can run those machines in with whatever configuration you want, so long as you've built them to then have that. But there aren't many, I won't, I won't say there aren't any because I don't know, but there aren't, I wouldn't imagine there are many um, OS images that expect you to give your OS Two v two uh, um, two two, uh, two, uh, two interfaces, right when you boot up and do your setup and installation. The only the use I can think of would be a smoke test, where you um, where you in your post build um, try to spin up a VM and make sure that all your interfaces are in fact asking on the correct ports or or. Uh, or, or, or grabbing the correct IPs or whatever it is, if you've got static networking across everything, um, that you might want to be able to do something like that. You can write a, you can write a, you can write a post processor to, to, to do that sort of smoke test if you want to. Um, and if, you, if, if that smoke test is important to your environment, I would recommend you do, because you, if you can get everything down to one click, your life gets better. Uh, you, you could you could bake in things into your small test dev environments. You can say, yeah. here, go ahead and uh, um, bake in this folder that I need on all of these particular machines you're running. Right. Um, you can have, uh, by the way, in, pa in Packer, uh, you don't need to have a single um, source and build. You can have multiple builds, multiple sources. Um, a build can take multiple sources at the same time and apply the steps in parallel to all of your builds, to all your, to all your sources. Mm -hmm. So you can run the same steps on Debian and CentOS if you really wanted to, just to find two different sources. And Packer will, by default, go ahead and start building all of them at the same time. So if you're trying to build a test dev environment and you want to have a bunch of uh, target VMs, well, maybe this is a good way to, pre to prepare all your state in a single way that you can then run on someone else's machine, too. What's the back end of the packet? Is the real gas the gas the page or box, the DD box? The back end to Packer, Packer itself is, a, is distributed as a Go binary. It runs on your machine. You just I know. do stuff. I but. So the so Packer communicates with your VM. Um, it sits outside and chats over um, SSH or WinRM as your communicator. Um, So 
I, I'm afraid I don't quite understand your question. I th think we're thinking of Packers being a different layers on the stack. Uh, you're th well, I was going to say, Packer first of all creates the VM, correct? Packer first creates the VM, yes. Okay. It, it uh, spins up a process, whatever. Then it connects to it through SSH. Yes, it does. Well, okay. And then they use, they, they, they write out everything, the application. It's taking place of the human. So, so, so there is a interactive stuff for VM early boot where it connects over some, for Quemu, it, it connects over VNC. It binds the VNC port and um, uh, you can't VNC viewer into the VM at the same time as it's doing its typing because um, of a limitation in Quemu where you can only have a single um, VNC, uh, a VNC viewer connected to a single process at the same time. But after it's done with this pre-boot, you can then VNC in as normal and watch it do all the rest, um, where it just does over SSH. But so it, it sets up as best it can um, to replace the human in the early boot stage and then talk computer protocols the rest of the way through. Um, because if you once you, once you can get a shell on a system, it doesn't matter what you're using. You use the system's stuff. Um, Arguably, you could build. Um, arguably, you could build uh, anything you can virtualize. Uh, if you, if you can virtualize, for example, uh, uh, what's that? Um, what's that uh, router choice? Um, starts with an N, I think. Um, uh, micro, sorry, Microtech. Uh, if you if you can take Microtech's router OS and virtualize it, which I think you can, you could, in fact pre-build your Microtik images the same way you connect over SSH and just instead of running Ansible, you run Microtik provision, provision of some sort. Alrighty. Is there anything else? Uh, you can reach me on IRC without a, a starting, starting Tuesday. Uh, you'll be able to reach me on IRC. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta press some power buttons. Uh, amazing. Uh, someone told me that uh, um, that that new motherboards come without magic wake on LAN packets enabled, and it's distressing because I want to just wake my machine from here, please. But I've got a machine on my no on my network. It's my gateway. That doesn't help me much. <laughs> Oh, oh the, I had a, the, there was a power loss, and um, they're, they're off right now. So turning them off again with a Wi-Fi outlet doesn't help me, because they're already off. I thought I had done that. Apparently, I had not. <laughs> yes, you, you learn these. I, I, happen to, I know for a fact there was a power outage um, of, 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 of at least 15 minutes. Um, in that area. So, as it is. Very cool. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>